Welcome to week three, services marketing. It's the consumer behavior week. So first up, expect callbacks, flashbacks, and reference to material that you have encountered in other subjects. Consumer behavior is often introduced as a chapter, standalone chapter in introduction marketing or marketing concepts. It has its own standalone subject. And here in week three, the material split between what's new for services marketing that we have to think about and a recap flashback of what is consumer behavior at its fundamentals. So session objectives for this round, we're going to go back over some of the CB basics. We will re-examine value and consumption, value and use. We're going to talk a couple of um, readings get an extra run in tonight. Uh, we have an introduction to the consumer experience process. So in terms of marketing this year, consumer behavior is really looking at value, consumption, and the influence that these factors have. Now, the way I see it is that for a lot of what we're going to deal with in services marketing, we're going to look at it from the producer's perspective. We're going to use the marketing mix, which uh, the controls the producer can use. We use models like Servuction, where it's really production oriented. And then we get into things like Service Blueprint, and you're very much looking at what can I do as a marketer to influence and impact the experience a consumer has. So this round, it's gonna be about examining some of the ideas and frameworks underpinning how consumers engage, what they get out of a service, and their processes around it. So the learning outcomes for this deck is a quick recap of the consumer decision process model, a separation of pre-purchase consumption and post-purchase as three stages of consumer activity and three stages that we need to examine and consider within basically within the overall context of services marketing and a little application of the theory. So let's talk about the activity first. On the website you're going to find a self-evaluation form. Uh, the idea here is that this is a very rough adaptation of one of the provided readings. And this is the concept of value. Rather, these are aspects that can be valued in a service environment uh, or a customer experience. Sensorial, emotional, cognitive, pragmatic, lifestyle, relationship. What I'm going to ask you to do, and I will recap and explain a little bit later in the proceedings, is I'm going to ask you to observe the other courses that you are involved in during the week and then I'm going to ask you to self-evaluate, self-score and just get a bit of a radar map of where you're at with these other courses. So that's the week ahead, that's going to be the practice. For example on the outside by the way uh, to make this work, the little end thing there, uh, I filled it out with fives all round because that way I get my radar plot out to five. You give your particular aspect a score of one to five based on the holistic experience of how is it uh, at the end of the class, after the class, how are you feeling at that point. You come back to this PowerPoint deck and you then use the editing function in here to input those scores into your framework and you will get a set of maps for each of the particular elements. You'll get a sense for how your, how your week went in an experiential week in review. It's applying the theory, it's taking the theory out for a run and saying, how does the theory work when I need to put it into context and into practice. The other piece of core theory that's uh, going to be in effect is this is the consumer behavior, uh, the decision model, pre-purchase, consumption, post-purchase. This is 
one of the universal screwdrivers of uh, basically of all of marketing. The entire marketing process is wrapped up on the screen in front of us and it basically will get a full recap in its own slide deck. But the short thing to be aware of is that by listening to these slides you are currently in consumption stage. At the end of the slides you'll be in post-purchase evaluation. But you've come to the slides through these sequences. So this is going to also mean there's a little bit of a meta reflection that, whilst I'm not a fan of it personally, it does take place. An alert goes out from Wattle to let you know that new content is available. You come to Wattle at your leisure to review this new content. So there's a stimulus queue. You know that there's going to be a class on. You'd like to see what um, the content's going to be about before you go to the class. So that's your problem awareness. Information search is internal and external. Because we are going back through frameworks that you're familiar with, because we're doing things that we've done before, there is a, a there's an opportunity here for you to use the internal knowledge, your memory, what you've learned already, what you've learned previously. There'll be a bit of external search, uh, particularly if there's any point you stop and Google something from the slides or you take a moment to go, wait, what? And look it up. So if I search is still on, still an option. And there's going to be a couple of points where you're probably going to pull some evaluation alternatives in your decision making. But ultimately, uh, you are here looking at this slide. Congratulations, you are in the consumption stage. You are at using. I'm not totally certain how you dispose of information and knowledge, but uh, if we figure that out, we can probably map out what happens 10 minutes before you walk into an exam. So, this week, two of the readings have really interesting things that I want to talk about. And periodically, readings will emerge that I'll find during the process, and I'll add them into the site, and I'll add them onto the slides. So, this round, how to sustain the customer experience. Well, this is a good paper and it's worth reading overall, but it's got this really, there's a couple of good take home moments out of here. Take home moment number one is that the customer experience is a compound. It is not one or the other, it's all three in varying weighting. So the experiential based marketing deals with customers as emotional, irrational, and rational consumers we're not always all aspects. There can be points in time where we are looking for the uh, straight up cognitive, I want the best value for money, I want the best experience, therefore I'm gonna use my rational side. I'm here for the fun, you're getting your emotional side up, and I'm making this judgment based on something that, you know, no real evidence, I just feel that this is the right call, the irrational. Now the second thing to note is that the customer experience takes place in what we refer to as moments of truth. And this is where it's the personal interaction between the customer and the company. So the moments of truth model will show up repeatedly. Uh, it'll show up in service delivery, it'll show up in personnel, uh, in the people part of the extended marketing mix. Effectively, because services are human-led and human-driven, the moment of truth is a significant and important waypoint. This is where co-production, co-creation, and production will take place. They take place at the moments of truth. So the other aspect is, uh, I gave you the, the exercise, and now I'm giving the, the reading to go with it. The six elements of the customer experience. There are two more elements in the paper. They are value creation as utilitarian, or value creation as hedonic. We'll get you into those by yourself. But I want to raise these six. Now they are important because this means that you're starting to go from service satisfaction, service quality, and the notion of services as a singular event or a singular artifact and into ideas of the, well, to start with, you've already been quite aware of the complexity. 
But looking at it as here are six factors that can be in play in varying levels throughout a customer experience. So if we take the sensory experience, the sensorial, relates to the sensors, the five sensors or six, um, depending on how you operate, there are something like eight, somewhere between seven and 30 sensors that can be mapped out. But basically we'll stick with five for the moment. It's the idea of doing it for the aesthetic, it's the aesthetical engagement, it's using the environment, it's using the ways in which you can cue a human body to respond to stimuli. So it's kind of interesting trying to do this with a video because even in the video you're just down to the audio, you've got audio visual, you've got the slides on the video in front of you and my voice. I've even taken out for this round the little pop-up video that goes in the corner normally. So that's sensorial. The relates to the senses, engaging the different senses. Emotional. This is basically what, uh, this is use of affect, affective, influence. The idea here is that we want to have the non, the non-rational side, the emotive side, the sense, so you've got the sensory side is the physical character, physical elements. The emotional side is your response. We want then to also avail ourselves of the cognitive. It's really important to understand that at no point do we say emotion is bad, cognitive good, cognitive good, cognitive bad, emotion good. We say you can have a very rational emotional experience. You can very logically, rationally, and emotionally respond to a circumstance. And that's good, and that's positive, and that's the thing that we should be trying to evoke. What elements work? So in the cognitive aspect, we see a little bit of problem solving. Uh, we see the use of rationality. We see uh, some of the more economic models show up. We see people using intentional decision choice matrices thinking things through. So that's your, your cognition side. Now the pragmatic key uh, idea here is things like the usability. Uh, again, we're thinking about a customer's experience. This is the art of doing, this is the action based. Insofar as pragmatic in this sense isn't really about does it evoke a physical action, in which case it's probably invoked the sensorial, uh, depending on the nature of the physicality, what's required, if it's skill-based, it's possibly evoking cognitive. So don't overlook the interlap between these things. On the lifestyle, does the uh, customer experience support, <coughs> does it affirm the values and beliefs of the individual? Is it consistent with our self-performance in this context? And in consumer behavior, we are many people to many people. We put on and play roles, we put on masks, sometimes metaphorically, sometimes literally. And we conduct ourselves in a way that suits our circumstances, conditions, and environments. Does this consumer experience that your value offer is making available to the consumer, does it fit their lifestyle? Does it support their belief in themselves, who they are, how they see themselves, where they see themselves in their community? And the last aspect is the relational. Now, relational and lifestyle crossover. Lifestyle's more values and beliefs than internal. But relational is, does the experience create a connection? Does it create a sense of belonging? Now it can be a sense of belonging through brand community, it can be a sense of belonging through interpersonal engagement, it can be a sense of belonging through shared lived experience. There are ways and means by which the relational becomes a facet of the customer experience. So these are important aspects because now we're starting to unpack in services marketing a real emphasis on experiential based outcome because it's intangible, because it's inconsistent, because it's inseparable, because the consumer has to put in the effort 
to get the outcome. The experience is what they're going to judge and measure the service on. So understanding some of the facets around what is a customer experience framework? What does it look like conceptually? How does it work practically? How do I experience it? This, when you are looking at something like a value offer, how does the value offer produce? Or what does the value offer produce along these six elements? How does it create these aspects of experience? And is there opportunity to do something different inside those areas? Yeah, the other thing that uh, to quickly raise up from the reading here is this is where uh, it's hedonic and utilitarian value on the consumer side. Hedonic is doing it for the pleasure. Utilitarian is doing it for the, uh, the value. So basically it's the rational versus the irrational. It's calculative against emotive. The key thinking here is that the value proposition is entering the framework here over on the corner. It's the offerings that have value. They create the experience. The experience is perceived by the customer. If it meets or exceeds their value expectation, then they are likely to be satisfied with the company. And this is going to create an ongoing recurring desire for co-creation of value, AKA the customer giving you money. Now, again, it may feel like we're playing in the generics pretty hard here. Uh, this is because we are trying to push through a theoretical framework. But if you think about this from the perspective of uh, the fitness, the Anytime Fitness, Fitness First gym membership, the offerings that have value for an Anytime Fitness is a space in which you can co-create your exercise training program. Sensorial, it's a gym, it's a very tactual, tactile environment. There are physical, pragmatic movements, elements. Does it fit a lifestyle? Do I see myself as a person who trains? Do I see myself as a fitness person? Relational, there's a lot of emphasis that comes into these areas around trying to create bonds amongst fellow participants and attendees. Uh, but if you're offering a 24-hour gym, part of what you're also offering is the contraposition to relational, which is individual. Train any time you like. Don't have to worry about there being other people there. Don't have to worry about the expectation of, oh, I can only train between nine and five. That's when the staff will be working. So you can go strongly, positive, relational. Let's build a community or strongly inverted relational, let's emphasize the individual and forego the community. And finally on the emotional, uh, gyms are immensely emotional places. The number of times that a workout routine has resulted in tears, and I say this as someone who has cried at the gym after beating a personal best or hitting a combination of moves in an exercise that I haven't been able to do for 20 years. Those are emotional experiences. They are pushing, there's a lot of emotional experiential value inside this. So when we start thinking about the overall value, there's the utilitarian value of go to the gym, get fit, be healthy, work more. And there's the hedonistic experiential aspects of go to the gym because it's fun, go to the gym because the biophysical chemical feedback your body will give you is going to be phenomenal, and go to the gym because you like it. So there's a hedonic and a utilitarian aspect. So that's a key thing to be always mindful of when you are tracking into these elements is there's a balance and it's fully possible that someone could get a huge amount of utilitarian value and hedonic value simultaneously. So those two aren't a spectrum, they're two separate scores side by side. Now let's talk about the services, the consumer behavior process. Fundamentally, services marketing is evaluated on process, which means that inside the marketing mix, 
The extended marketing mix concept of process and the seduction model concept of internal processes become a lot more powerful, but they are still dependent on the existence of the rest of the mix. You need to have a value offer, so you need there to be a product in order for a process to have an outcome and if there isn't a product, then the best process in the world won't create value. So you've got to interweave and interlink these concepts. Now this is picking up the other reading uh, that's up on the site, because we're going to look at the three elements. This is really looking at how do we... We've got pre-purchase, we've got service encounter, we've got post-purchase. We've got the three blocks. Now, services marketing differs from goods marketing in the service encounter stage. Obviously because it's named and labeled service encounter, but also because a key part of the pre-purchase is the idea of trying to assess something that is intangible, inseparable, inconsistent, and there may only be one go at this, that sufficiently perishable that even if you could evaluate it, by the time you've evaluated it, you couldn't do it again. So there are really key aspects of the, again, the IHIP process heavily influences the service encounter stage. So this is different from how goods work. So we need to engage it. But also, because the service encounter stage, the consumption stage, is different, it sets off a different set of pre-purchase events. So we have a, the standard issue, everything that you'd be used to from uh, goods-based marketing, through to there are a few bonus level things that you need to read up and think about. Now, in the pre-purchase stage, this is one of my favorite, this contains two of my favorite pieces of uh, services theory. I absolutely love the attributes framework. Search attribute, experience attribute, credence attribute, they are an enormously important way of considering the world, the world of services marketing. And we're gonna go into those depth uh, elements in a moment. Same way, perceived risk. I did my whole honors thesis on risk perception, so I'm a mad keen fan of this whole literature. Um, I can talk about it for multiple hours, I'll try not to. I'll just bring it down to the keys. But fundamentally, we're used to the idea of, in consumer behavior, consumers are driven by the recognition of a need or a want. The needs, wants arguments for another time. To is that, that sense of there is a problem to be solved, a need to be met, a want to be satisfied, or an opportunity to do something new. That will require you to have some degree of, okay, I am feeling something, I desire to transfer that feeling into a solution. The more knowledge you have in the domain, the more, the easier it is to go, oh hey, um, I got a particular craving, and that craving is for about 200 kilometers worth of overland driving. I need a road trip. Need arousal, I recognize it, I recognize the sensations, I recognize the desire, I recognize that I want a co-created self-service experience of taking the car out for a spin through the back roads, and I recognize that from internal search. Alternatively, it could be like, a, I've got this, I've got an urge to do something, do something interesting. I don't know what interesting is. So I will start looking internally. What was exciting previously? Draw my knowledge. I'll start looking externally. I'll start creating knowledge. Like, yeah, I've got to do something on the weekend. I need a holiday. I should go do. I start searching for things. I start engaging an active information search. Now, in. The consumer behavior landscape, we are familiar with active engagement of searches because they create, uh, you can then on an external search, draw down on information from other people. You can draw down on information from marketing provider content, 
there's a whole bunch of different ways you can do it. And a lot of advertising and promotion work happens in this external information search area. But both of these areas are going to evoke some perceived risk. Um, and part of it's going to be around, there'll be even things like the fear of missing out. The FOMO statement is a perception of risk. Oh no, what if I, what if I miss the opportunity? What if this never happens again, ever? Or I could, that's the fear of missing out. That's coming off your internal. Or the, I know I meant to go to this thing and I missed it and all my friends said it was great. Knowledge-based internal fear of missing out, perceived risk rises. Risk of not doing anything rises. External searches, there are, again, when we get into risk perception, uh, we'll pull up some of the different risk factors. Something like, I'm gonna go do something I haven't done before evokes reputational risk of, is it the sort of thing that you're known for? Is it the sort of, well, I didn't think he'd be into that sort of music. Uh, the number of, also there are a lot of things now, there's almost like a third function emerging here. We don't have it fully down, but this is the algorithm pre-filter. The information search where we start thinking about th we start looking for things on the internet and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all the others and Google try to helpfully give us information in advance. And you find yourself on wish.com looking at product options going, how has my, li my life led to this moment? Also, what's the shipping on that? So, information search. That sets you up with a set of choices that you can go act on. But also what you're starting to have here in services marketing is this little problem of, in good space marketing, like wish.com, you can look at the product. You can see the specifications of the product. You can assume product performance based on stats, statistics, and prior. But in services, that's gonna depend entirely on how the service, the nature of the service, the attributes that it possesses. So your information search is gonna go into a prediction of performance, an evaluation of alternatives. One of the alternatives that always sits inside the services decision framework is do it yourself. So the evaluation in goods-based does not always include make my own product, but in services, it does include provide my own service. So let's put this to a quick example. Needs arousal, hungry. Information search, internal, external. GYG is pretty tasty. Nando's is pretty good value. Uh, grilled, little bit pricey, but you know, satisfying. That's the internal search, looking around the place, there's a sale on, there's a special offer on. Throw in the search attributes, well, each of them has traits I'm familiar with from their food product. Experiential wise, GYG breaks the laws of time and physics, the speed at which it serves. Grilled's a bit slow and I'm in a hurry. Nando's is a bit variable and depends how much market demand there is. No, I'm not gonna know till I get in there. Um, credence attributes, am I gonna know whether this was tasty? Yep, chances are I am going to. So. The three attributes are pretty good, but then the fourth, so the three alternatives are Canberra Centre, North Quarter, Venue One, Nando's, across the road, grilled, slightly further up the chart, up the um, mall, GYG. But if it's down between grilled and GYG, I'm walking past Coles and suddenly I've got self-service as a viable option. So whatever it was I was gonna budget for myself to spend inside either of those two food ventures can become a self-service solution and there's always self-service as I will do it myself for myself sits inside there as a permanent alternative. So then we create service expectations. What is it? Our sum total experiences plus what we know about the service from external information, peer information, talking to others, proxy observations as we walk past the service provider. That sets up our expectations, then we go into the purchase. Now let's talk for a moment about 
the attributes. Each service has uh, yeah, each service has three attributes. The level of the attributes varies. The higher something is in a search attribute, the easier it is to be pre-evaluated. On a search attribute, if we're talking about McDonald's fast food drive through that's really high on search attributes. Pretty much, you can evaluate what you're up for from photos. You can evaluate what you're up for in terms of the food has a high level of search attributes. The experience has a high level of, you can find out information about it beforehand. Step it up one to the experience attributes. Products that are high in experiential experience attributes, they take place during the experience. The evaluation is within the experience or very close to after the experience. You can't judge it beforehand. You have to try it in order to find out. This is also where your co-creation of the experience attribute comes into play. How well do you play your role will determine how well you are, will also determine your evaluation. The more you're pushing in, the more likely you are to be satisfied on the grounds of, well, if I'm not satisfied, I didn't do my job or my side of it very well. Third attribute is credence. Now, credence is a is where there is an uncertainty to the outcome, or you are unfamiliar with the service experience, so you can't judge it beforehand because you don't know what you're looking for. You can't judge it during because you don't know enough as to whether this is a good service, and you're not really sure afterwards either. So, high credence-based products are really challenging for marketers because. The customer can have the best objective experience on paper and still be uncertain, but also may feel on completely on attributes that are not connected to the core of the service delivery. Say for instance, uh, medical services, you're dealing with a doctor at um, the emergency ward, there Bedside manner might be non-existent, but you go in there with uh, a significant injury and you come out with treatment. Or you go in with uh, a badly broken arm and you leave with both arms. You could be going, oh, they were very unpleasant. They were, oh, it was very painful. That was, not, oh, that was a terrible experience. But if you'd had a less skilled service provider, you'd be coming out with one arm. That's a little extreme example, but lawyers, medicine, dentists, these are actually hairdressers as well. Where you're not sure how to evaluate the quality, the credence attributes are a challenge because they will raise the perception of risk. Flipping over into perceived risk, the IHIP framework comes back up. Also keep in mind other customers as we start talking about perceived risk. So the five main types, the five most common types, the financial risk. Every service comes with the risk that you don't get value out of it, therefore you lost money, therefore you got ripped off, etc. Financial risk. It was expensive, it cost me stuff, or worse, it was expensive, then I had to have it done again because I didn't get the outcome I was after. There's performance risk, which is the service doesn't get the job done. You know, you go out for a good night out and it doesn't happen. The night is not good. You're not entirely convinced the night took place outside, but things like you've gone and booked a travel destination, you've, you know, going off on tour, you're going off on holiday, and it's supposed to be nice and relaxing, and it's the most stressful thing you've put yourself into for a long time. Performance, performance failed. So, Again, you're starting to see how the attributes will link across into the risks. The higher something is on an experience attribute, the greater chance it is that there will be a performance risk. That you'll be in there and going, yeah, this isn't what I came here for. Which will then possibly evoke a financial risk of, uh, cut my losses and run. Third up, physical risk. Because services are personal based, 
interpersonal based and you are present at the point of consumption, there is physical risk in the use of a service. Uh, it's a sliding scale, sometimes you can sell that physical risk as a feature and charge more for it and it goes into the credence experience attributes of that was awesome, I was in so much danger, I haven't had that much, uh, I haven't had such a good time because you know, physical risk can be sold. But physical risk also, you know, come back to the gym membership, the Anytime Fitness membership. You're training on your own at three o'clock in the morning in an isolated gym somewhere in a strange town because you can. There's physical risks of both the gym exercise, but then also the you're operating in isolation. There are all sorts of these risks that, again, search attribute can minimize some of physical risks. Experience attribute, you can get in there and go, okay, pulling back on the co-creation here, outside my comfort zone, stopping. But I'm gonna just light up physical risk sitting alongside social risk, is social risk is also the consumption of the surface and the consumption within the surface. If you've ever walked into a restaurant, looked around and gone, yeah, I'm in the wrong place, or I'm so not dressed for this, then you've experienced the social risk of not conforming to the expectation of the other customers in the service scape. So we know that we've got social risk, which is loss of pride, loss of esteem, loss of uh, social standing, change in reputation. This brings us down to psychological risk, and that is because services are also experiential, a lot of the service consumption benefit or cost transpires inside the mind of the consumer. So as well as the body being at risk, the mind is at risk. You have a bad experience inside a service, it may do, it can dent the inside of your confidence, it can make you uncomfortable, you can be like, ah, why am I here? I don't wish to be part of this service anymore, how do I leave? Uh, to run this one quickly again on the perceived risk in a practical example, Let's take going to a new, going to a stand-up comedy event, you haven't heard of the performer before, but the venue's had a good track record, so you're going to put down your 30 bucks, and you plan to buy a couple of drinks, so you're going to set yourself a budget of like 50 or 70 bucks for the evening. Performance risk, you're pretty confident that you're not going to have much to do, because you know, you're going to be in the audience. Fiscal risk should be pretty low. Social risk, touch and go. Psychological risk, touch and go. You get in there, you get yourself uh, what seems to be you know, a strangely vacated good seat in a good view, and the show starts, and next thing you know, the performer's coming down to you, and it's an audience interaction, and suddenly you're on social risk, your psychological risk is up high, your performance risk is suddenly, is this, am I gonna enjoy this? Am I about to be the comedy routine or am I going to enjoy the comedy routine and the spotlight's on you and if you want to try going saying to the comedian that's it I'm out I'm uncomfortable with what you're doing here you get back up on the stage me audience you performer social risks psychological risks the loss of face in front of a bunch of strangers and also the memory of this event so Something simple as laying down 70 bucks can bring out a whole hell of a lot of stuff. So there's basically a whole bunch of the perceived risk that takes place. Again, as with previously, risk is not to be regarded as inherently something to mitigate. You can embrace... Now, embracing financial risk is called gambling. We sell it by the metric cube. We sell it by the minute in every sporting event in Australia. We sell it wholesale at casinos. Financial risk is a viable feature to put into a product. Same for performance risk, same for physical risk. You can embrace these risks and make them features, push them through into your search and experience attributes and turn them into a facet of the value offer that you create. And this is why 
the whole way through, it's never going to be about a thing exists, mitigate, it's going to be give yourself your context, work out if it will work for your target market, embrace or mitigate as required. Now, the behavioral model. Alrighty. I've added a couple of things on the back of this one. Uh, the standard model is here. That's what the one the, uh, the authors provided for us. Uh, I've whacked a couple of things on the side here because eventually everything's going to come down to a behavioral intention of do I, will I buy, will I trial, will I trial again, will I reject? That's your behavioral tension set. Intention to behave comes with two factors. Is it going to be of perceived value to me? So all the stuff we're leaning towards in value creation, understanding co-creation, and then comes back to perceived value. Perceived value has a direct impact on behavioral intention. It has an indirect impact on behavioral intention through overall satisfaction, which leads to the perception of the quality of the firm, which leads to, I should go there again, behavioral intention. But what's really important in the back end here is that satisfaction is determined by three factors. Satisfaction on the attributes, the, and that's the big three, the uh, back up, search, experience, and credence. So those attributes, which means that that's the value offer getting a run, which also means we're talking about product delivery and physical evidence. So the attributes in terms of search comes through a lot through physical evidence, in terms of credence comes through delivery, in terms of experiential comes through product and delivery, maybe even physical evidence. So there's overlaps, cross wiring and Venn diagrams happening. Transaction quality, how services are not judged just on the outcome, but they're also judged on the process. How was it for you during the service process will determine some of your overall satisfaction. But because it's also a, a mediated service created by other people, if the transactions are low quality, it will lead to dissatisfaction and it will lead to lowered perceived value. Down the back, so that means the back end to transaction quality is this, um, the two extended marketing mix elements of process and people. Same for perceived value as well as its direct impact it is influenced by how well the transactions, how well the processes took place. So seduction is back on its invisible processes leading to transaction quality. Perceived value is up for price. Price is influenced by promotion and promotion and, pro and physical evidence interact to give a sense of the money I've paid for the service I experienced seems to match the physical environment I'm standing in, therefore I'm getting good value. Massive interconnectivity to be embraced or mitigated. Now, the other aspect here of services marketing. Welcome to the fundamental mantra of consumer behavior in services marketing is perception governs reality. Service, perceived service quality is the difference between what the customer expected and what the customer has perceived. This is referred to often as the service gap model. It's the zone of tolerance. We're going to pick these two up a little later in the semester. But right now it comes down to is, if the performance is greater than the expectations, it beats the expectations. If it beats it by a small factor, it's satisfaction, it's positive disconfirmation, which is a long way of saying satisfaction. And it's good. It's positive comes with a couple of potential problems and hooks which you're going to encounter in a second. But your danger zone is critical success. Now, a factor that needs to be understood in services marketing is I will talk about the concept of 
failure, success, and catastrophic success and catastrophic failure as ends of the spectrum. Something going unexpectedly right in a manner that you didn't predict is a catastrophic success. The reason it's a catastrophic success is that you don't have any control over how it took place, so you have no functional capacity to replicate it. However, because it has taken place, it has now established itself as part of your reputation and has established itself as part of the customer's expectations of your service delivery. Hence, a catastrophic success can be as damaging, if not more damaging, to an organization than a catastrophic failure. Mostly because in catastrophic failures, we sit down and very carefully try and figure out what went wrong, why did it go wrong, and there are many case studies written about the whole triaging of post-event failure and there's a lot less work that's been written about the triaging of post-event success. So it's a thing to watch for. Uh, it's a very important facet in services marketing is that when you delight a customer, that is going beyond their positive expectations, but it's also going to move the zone of tolerance upwards and they're going to expect better quality service from you next time. If you can consistently do this for, well, you can't do it forever. You can consistently do it for a while, and then you are setting a benchmark that may not be economically viable to sustain. It may be difficult physically to be better than last time. All these become facets of the inconsistency, consistency element, the eye hip element. But ultimately, delight will hook back in and modify perceptions of and modify expectations. So you want to hit it now and then, but probably not that often. Down in the middle is getting the job done. This is the much, un frankly, the completely underrated aspect of marketing is our ability to be exceptionally ordinary and ordinary on a routine and regular basis. Satisficing is, it gets the job done, it's neither good nor bad, it meets the expectations, it confirms what you were expecting, and let's face it, if you're going to McDonald's on, going to the McDonald's off Barry Drive at three in the morning, if you're pulling up to the 24 hour drive through anywhere on the way home, from a big night out, then <coughs> the satisfice is good enough. You don't need it to be brilliant, you need it to be. So expectations meets confirmation. They're both positive. The performance equals the expectation. You all come back. Nothing ventured, nothing lost. You didn't gain anything, it did the job, job done. Now the point where there are some elements that we will, uh, we have a whole chapter dedicated to service recovery. Where the expectations are, the service is performed and it's below expectation. That will lead to disappointment or negative disconfirmation in services speak, which has a whole series of outcomes. One of which is missed here, which is go back and buy again. So there'll be a point in time that you'll go, you'll go to a service, it will disappoint you and you go, that doesn't usually happen. I'll buy another one to see if it happens twice. Um, so there are, if it is a routine level of disappointing that is going to improve the desire to switch providers, it will you know, send off a flurry of disgruntled tweets, f post to Facebook, this was terrible. Uh, hashtag first world problems, hashtag service recovery, hashtag, hashtag. You can complain to the firm, you can complain to another person, you can complain to a third party, you can stand on the street corner doing what you want. But fundamentally, post-purchase boils down to three points. A service was performed, it has been perceived by the customer, does the customer perceive that service performance to be better than they expected? 
equal to what they expected or worse than what they expected and they will then judge their next behavioral intention from there. Remember, it's about the expectation and the perception. You can delight someone with a performance that would satisfy a second customer and disappoint a third. So it's all about the market, the segment, the target, and the managing the expectations of a key audience who you know and are expecting to use your service. All right, couple of things out of the textbook, because that's from the readings. Let's pick up the textbook. Uh, the consumer decision choice recap, we are going to do that as a standalone slide deck. I'll talk people through each of the elements. From a services marketer's perspective, uh, stimulus is going to pick up elements of interest, particularly around the idea of service scape is there in the physical queuing. Problem awareness triggered by encountering a service scape. Problem awareness in services also coming from the fact that a service is intangible. So there's that moment of what is it they need I can't simply look to the shelves to get something off the shelves to solve it. How can I solve it myself? Do I need to bring a third party in for my solution? Uh, information search, again, experiential thing about the attributes here. Search attributes means that it can be done with external search quite more readily compared to uh, experiential, which will be more internal search. A lot of word of mouth takes place in services, a lot of personal recommendation, a lot of uh, connecting to the audiences, which again means know your markets and understand the market segments when you're dealing with this. Choice phase, the buying using disposing is really interesting because services are consumed and used in parallel and the disposal of the service not the physical evidence accompanying the service, but the service itself. You go to the dentist, you've got a couple of hours after the dentist, if you've had a filling where you're waiting for your body to dispose of the uh, numbing effect, but you're also having lingering after effects of a service. So you go for a massage and you're sore for a few days, it's the equivalent of you've got a physical good that you've been meaning to throw out, but you just haven't gotten around to doing it yet. So some of the factors around the consumption change do vary. And post-purchase evaluation, it's all down to the zone of tolerance, the service gap model, and the expectations perceptions. Now, a couple of things I want to briefly highlight, uh, figure 4.4. Again, I've raised some of these along the way through. This is about thinking around the overlaps. One, perceived risk is higher for service purchases. So you need to be conscious around risk modification, perception modification. Think as a marketer, how do we decrease, if we're going to deal with perceived risk, how do we embrace it to make it a feature? or how do we mitigate it to lower it as a cost. Services uh, have a high level of brand loyalty, so that's about interpersonal relationships, it's about the human connection inside the service delivery. How do we embrace it? How do we realize it? How do we go and draw down now from brand strategy, draw down from integrated marketing communication? Point three is really important. Of Service customers rely more on personal sources. So don't mess with this. Influencers on Instagram are not personal sources. They are advertisers. They are distribution channels of ideas. Interpersonal communication. When you start getting people to try and go out and recruit several of their friends, it's called multi-level marketing, it's mostly illegal, it's also known as Amway, and it sucks for the rest of the business. We need there to be viable, credible, uninfluenced, 
personal word of mouth. If you're getting bad word of mouth, or ordinary, or no word of mouth from your customers, fix your value proposition. Fix your value offering. That will create the word of mouth you seek, the credible, organic, viable, sustainable word of mouth. Don't do anything dumb. Don't do any of the, oh, what a, if we were to bribe our customers to tell their friends to bring more of their friends, like no, keep it credible, keep it human, keep it real. Final two here, services customers are often in a much crowded, uh, it's much smaller markets, um, with fewer alternatives. So this means that your targeting your positions got to be much more refined. If you're only positioning against a few other alternatives, you need to really think that position strategy through. And lastly, you are always positioning against self-service. This is the fundamental difference in the consumer decision process, goods versus services. Services are always positioning against the self-service option which means that you can either mitigate by being a better and more convenient economy of scale, superior alternative, viable alternative than self-service, or you can embrace by providing the component parts to enable the self-service. So every hairdressing salon on the planet that sells hair straighteners and hair dryers and hair product and self-dyeing kits and home touch-up kits is enabling the self-service in order to retain that loyalty of, look, you don't have to come in 12 times, you can come in six times, but between the two, in the two month gap, here, use some of our stuff. Let us help you help yourself. Also, if it turns out it's much harder to use the stuff at home than it is to use the stuff at the Salon, you've sold them a bunch of stuff and they're going to come back and use your service. That's what brand loyalty and a, being a better alternative is about. All right, uh, I mentioned this a couple of times, but this is the absolute, uh, this is the hard lock. This is the gold standard of dealing with services and customers, perceptions versus expectation to have customer satisfaction, you have to be better than, better or equal to what they were expecting, and they have to perceive what you have delivered to be better. And this is the killer. They have to perceive what you have delivered. Customer perception defines reality. Even if objectively you can go back and show the 12 different touch points there's 12 moments of truth where you engage that customer on the criteria that they've given you a one out of five on, they still didn't perceive that you engaged them, so they're still not satisfied because their expectations weren't met. So this is where market research comes in. This is where market segmentation comes in. This is where targeting comes in. You need to know and understand your customer and assess up the right customer so that they will embrace the product offering you're providing and they will see and perceive the value in what you're delivering. Last thing on this, uh, on the frameworks. This is, uh, okay, this is the thing that's gonna recur when we start really getting to value offer and we get into pricing. The idea that during service experience, the customer is going to want to exert control. At the same time, the customer will give up control if they feel that they're getting value for stepping back. So control is going to be an important element to your value. Do you want to have people who, do you want to set up a service that embraces control and switches over most of the options to the service customer? Or do you want to have something that mitigates self-control, perceived control, 
takes the customer outside of their control base and sells it as a feature. You've got to be conscious of this again, mitigate or embrace. And finally, uh, costing. This is a thing that pops up in the chapter. It should be familiar with these, but this is one of those ones where it's important to go and think this is a generic framework. Search cost, transaction, learning, loyalty, customer, emotion, and cognitive. These apply to physical goods. What you need to be doing is thinking, how do I need to adapt so that they apply to service goods? To service goods, to service products. What are the costs associated with seeking out a new service when the service is a credence service? How does the service cost modify when it's experiential? How does, and start thinking IHIP as well in here. If it's a perishable service, how does the first time transaction cost work? How expensive is that first transaction? Learning costs. If it's a perishable service, it's a limited edition, limited time only, how expensive is the gaining of the knowledge required to use the service? And that's, that is a big one that you want to be thinking here. You're going to have knowledge and uh, in Canberra there was a laser tag venue that used a particular type of uh, high-end laser blaster doesn't get used anywhere else there's a learning curve associated with learning the venue learning the maps and it shut down after six months so I have useless knowledge of a service product I can never experience again stuck in my brain I have learning costs it also meant that the next time I looked at something went, well, I could learn how to do that. Or I could not, because it was expensive last time. Customer habits, uh, this is one that I, again, when we start thinking about the meta use of services marketing theory, what are some of the customer habits associated with the way that you engage the university products? What are some of, what, what's it gonna cost to change some of those behavioral patterns? What's some of the value you get from your behavior patterns? what some of the costs that the behavior patterns are picking up. Uh, emotional costs, services are person to person. You may have a very strong connection to your service provider. There may be that when your service provider decides to leave and move on and move to a new location, that you go with them. It may be that the notion of the service provider being just in it for the money, oh, I actually didn't like any of you, I'm just here to be paid, would be a devastating idea. Flip side is that you may find the emotional taxing thing of, look, give me the coffee, do not engage with me as a person. So again, one of the things to watch for is emotional costs of disengaging, but also emotional costs of engaging. It's like, I don't want to befriend my service provider. And I will say this of every hairdresser I've ever known is I don't like getting my hair cut. It's not a thing that I'm particularly fond of doing. I have to do it far more frequently these days. So it's go in, get the job done, don't engage with me. I usually have, um, I also leave it to the last possible moment to get done so it's like I am in a high stress high pressure scenario I am not here to be friends get the job done serve pay leave emotional cost they actually disconnecting from the processing that I'm doing internally in my head to talk to someone is kind of expensive I'd rather pay for if they would chuck an extra 10 bucks on it for a silent service I'd probably give them 20 so Core practice activity, week ahead. Download, you're gonna need multiple copies of it, one per uh, experience you wanna go and examine. Download the file during the week. Do it as a holistic, as a whole of experience. So if you could do it per lecture and tutorial, you could do it per um, subject overall. Make your decision, again, what granularity you want to do here, but go give it a review, how does how has the experience mapped against an aspect on um, one of these six elements? So, read the customer experience paper, 
map it, get some practice, get some experience of going, who am I as a customer? What am I experiencing here? Work with that knowledge, work with that information, and we'll come back to it in a little bit later in the weeks. So a quick recap, consumer behavior is complicated. There's a full semester subject for it, there's a lot. There's a lot of things, but the keys are, think about the interaction effects now. The IHIP model interacts with other things. What impact do you have from those elements we've been picking up along the way? What does, how does consumer behavior theory influence or inform the seduction model? What's happening in terms of, if there are four customer outcomes, delight, satisfaction, satisfies and disappoint, where does that fit in terms of what you want to do? Also, uh, in terms of if you're going to engage in a value offering, examining a value offering, where do you want to position it? Do you want to be adequacy? Do you want to be satisfies? Do you want to be mid-card because mid-card is respectable? Not everyone gets to be world champion. Not everyone needs to be world champion. We need to have more in the satisfaction and satisficing than we do in the delighting. Satisfaction and satisfice is sustainable. Disappoint and delight are unsustainable for largely the same reason. They are deviations outside the expected process. They are difficult to plan for. It's difficult to plan for disappointment as well. It's really hard to actually disappoint. We've tried it on experiments. Uh, but also delight is not sustainable because it moves the benchmark of ex the expectation benchmark up each and every time. And with that, 50% of the class is dissatisfied because I've released something beforehand. 50% of the class is satisfied because I've released something beforehand. Our 50-50 split means that actually on perception, I can't, I either have 100% um, or 0% because perception beats reality. What you perceive the value of this to be is what it is and that is more important than any objective thing I can layer into it. Perception beats reality. There is no objectivity in services marketing. There is only the perception of value. And whether that value has delighted, satisfied, satisfied or disappointed.